Could everybody please take their seats and we can get started on time. Could we have the agenda up on the screen? Thanks. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and Happy New Year. Welcome to the January 2023 general meeting of the Greater Pine Island Civic Association. It's great to see you all here, both those who have come in person and our audience on Facebook Live. Welcome, everyone. As you know, everyone is welcome to GPICA meetings, whether they're members or not. But membership for individuals is only $15 a year for singles and $25 for couples. And you get a deal if you plan to live a long time because you can pay $300 as an individual or $500 per couple for a lifetime membership. You can join online at gpica.org or at the front door of any of our meetings. As members, you support the largest civic organization on the islands. We have nearly 300 members. And you're kept to date, up to date on everything that the GPICA stands for maintaining our low-key old Florida lifestyle, preserving our sensitive nat natural areas, keeping development within bounds, supporting our island-friendly small businesses, welcoming visitors and newcomers to all our communities. Matt Lachey, Matt Lachey Isles, Pine Island Center, St. James City, Pineland, and Boquilia. The GPICA has been confronted with unique challenges in the wake of Hurricane Ian. While it's been fabulous to see the islands coming back, and our beautiful islands are coming back, thousands of residents are still struggling three months after Ian with debris removal, permitting, navigating county, state, and federal agencies and their myriad procedures, finding supplies for rebuilding, getting our potholed roads repaired, and even finding temporary places to live while they figure out next steps. To that end, we have invited county officials to our meeting tonight to answer your questions, hear your comments, and in general, keep in touch with our unique challenges. But we, before we begin our program, we need to attend to a few items of business. So first, we're going to have the treasurer's report, and if Mike Sweeney will come up and give that, and maybe we can see that on the screen. There it is. There it is. <laughs> speak up, speak up, Mike. Yeah. Sure. Um, in the money market, uh, there's $16,763.11. The checking contains $7,117.98. We have a CD that's, uh, that investment is now worth $76,370.54. Uh, money that came in, there was a $272.49 in cash came in during the month of uh, December. Uh, the was. Uh, $80 of that was in cash, and then the rest of it was electronic uh, credit card transfers. That was $192.49. And the money out, we spent, uh, you may remember, last month we rented the uh, church here. So we spent $400 for the rental of the church, the Methodist church here. And that is the uh, uh, budget. Is there a motion to... I don't think we need Great. a motion. Okay. You, you have presented the budget, and now we all know what it is. 
Okay, so I have a couple of announcements. Uh, the first one is that, uh, as many of you know, our traditional meeting place, the Pine Island Elks Club, sustained serious hurricane damage. And since then, we've been meeting here in the Methodist Church. Uh, but this beautiful venue has been expensive for us, so we need to explore other options. So as required by our bylaws, I'm reporting to you that I've rep I have appointed a small ad hoc committee to look into a change of venue for our meetings, and we'll keep you up to date on their progress. My second announcement is the upcoming public hearing at 9 o'clock in the morning this Thursday, January 12th, at the hearing examiner's meeting room in Fort Myers, 1500 Monroe Street. This is all on our website. Um, and this is regarding a 1.4 acre parcel on the south side of Pine Island Road, about half a mile west of Veterans Parkway. And if the IT person could put up the picture of that spot. Mm. Can you see that? You know, and so that's, uh, as you're going, um, uh, as you're leaving Mount Lachey and you're going out to Veterans Parkway and you're about uh, half a mile west of Veterans Parkway, it's there on the right. The owner of this little piece of property would like to construct a used car lot that would sell and rent vehicles to visitors to the islands. To do this, the owner would need to change the land use designation from agricultural to commercial planned development. So if you have any thoughts about the desirability of this land use change, or the idea of a used and rental car lot at the entrance to the islands, we urge you to join several of our members who intend to speak at the public hearing. We can put you in contact with, uh, with them if you write to info at gpica.org, or you can speak to one of our board members or myself after the meeting. Uh, board members, if you're there in the audience, just wait. Raise your hand and wave so people know where you are. Well, there are a couple there, and then there are two in the back, and there are some on Facebook Live. All right, um, information about this hearing, uh, more information about this hearing can also be found on our website. Um, I don't know if this, is, if this makes sense, but we thought if, if we could do a brief poll on this issue, we'd like to ask if just off the top of your head, if you support or oppose the change of land use designation on this property. So if you feel comfortable doing so, if you oppose the change of land use from agricultural to commercial plan development, if you oppose it, please raise your hand, okay? If you support this change, please raise your other hand, okay? Thank you. The next uh, brief item of business is regarding the election of board members that will happen at our February meeting. Board member Sherry Perkins will explain the process and tell you who's running and ask for additional nominations from the floor. So Sherry, come on up. Helen appointed a nominating committee with Scott. Um, Scott. What? <laughs> What's last name? What? Scott Wilkinson and um, and I, and Scott couldn't be here tonight. Um, oh. So th we talked with the board members, and we talked with family and friends here, and we have nominated a, the slate. There will be three people being nominated from the nominating committee. Um, anyone can be a member of the board who is at least 18 years of age. They subscribe to the principles, objectives, and purpose of the organization. They have paid their dues, and they reside or own property in the Greater Pine Island Civic Association area. So the um, Mike Sweeney, would you stand up, our treasurer? His term is over, and he has said he would be willing to serve another three-year appointment. 
So this is Mike Sweeney. Helen Fox, our president, has said her term is up and she will run for election again. Um, we have uh, Tim Heights, who is a new nominee. He's a former board member from several years ago. And we also open the floor for nominations from anyone that would like to nominate somebody else on the slate of officers. And then you can nominate people and these three people and anyone else that's nominated will be on the ballot at the February meeting. Is there anybody who would like to uh, be on the board? <laughs> Say that again, please. They can also make nominations by sending an email to info, I-N-F-O, at G-P-I-C-A.org. Did everybody hear that? Info at G-P-I-C-A dot org. But I saw a hand when yes. we asked. Can you put your name, Great. address, and phone number? Is anybody else interested in being on the board and running for board, being on the board. It's fun, it's a lot of work. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you have any uh, friends and neighbors that you know that might be good candidates, please ask them. Um, and they also can uh, send a note to um, info at gpica.com. Dot org. And, or, dot org, yeah. so that they're Okay. We'll be contacting all nominees, um, and they will make a brief presentation at the election next time to say what their experience is or what they like to do or why they want to be on the board. Are there any questions? See you next month. Okay, thank you. Finally, we'd like to welcome members of the Greater Pine Island Alliance, of which the GPICA is a member. And this, uh, the alliance is new on the islands, and it's new to some of you. So I'm going to ask our treasurer, Mike Sweeney, who has been at every single one of the weekly meetings of the alliance, to come up and give you a brief overview of what the alliance is and what they do. Thank you all again. Um, first of all, let me tell you what the Greater Pine Islands Alliance is. It is an alliance. It's an alliance of all of the various organizations that make up Pine Island. And I uh, just got a quick list here. This is not an all-inclusive list, but it'll give you an idea of the number of people that are involved. And I want to say that the two gentlemen that are sitting right up here in the front on the right side are really the leaders, if you will, of this organization. Uh, the American Legion, the Beacon of Hope, the FEMA uh, people, the Florida Division of Emergency Management, the Fine Swine, the Greater Pine Island Alliance, uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Pine Island Civic Association, Lee County, Matt Lachey Civic Association, the Matt Lachey Hookers, the Methodist Church, the Pine Island uh, Community Church, the Mullet Runners, uh, the Pine Island's Wellness Operation, the Tiny Homes, uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and other guests, all have uh, participated in this alliance. And all of them are um, willing to put either, for example, the commissioner here tonight has shown up to just about every meeting that we've had um, and has problem solved. And I think that uh, both Aaron and Jay could tell you a good deal more about what he's done behind the scenes. Um, some of the things that we just uh, reviewed in the last uh, meeting included the, perhaps many of you saw, a big uh, activity out here on uh, Monday morning. That was the Matt Lachey hookers organizing the uh, uh, construction debris uh, construction, excuse me, construction and drywall uh, handouts. So there was all sorts of handouts of free drywall, free uh, construction materials, uh, plus electrical supplies, all that kind of stuff. Um, the roadway cleanup. Maybe if you've been in and out to Matt Lachey. If you drove out on Sunday, you might have noticed that the 
roadways looked a little bit cleaner and there were a whole lot of people standing out on the sides of the roads picking stuff up. That was uh, the, one of the Alliance's sponsored activities. Actually, it was greater, again, that was the Matt Lachey hookers that actually originated or got, and got most people involved in that. Um, other things that we've discussed are there's three different groups that are becoming to the island uh, during January to help with cl debris cleanup, uh, vegetative removal, uh, and the mucking and gutting of homes. Uh, they include Spirit Inspiritus, Bona Responds, and the Florida Methodist Disaster Recovery. Concerns are expressed about how residents of the Palms Trailer Park, which lives up in the, or the, is up in the north end of the island in Boquilia, and that's almost exclusively Spanish speaking up there. Um, and the Red Cross has been up there, um, and some issues with electrical final inspection are uh, occurring, and we're trying to get that stuff resolved so that uh, the power can get back onto some of the trailers up there. And also, many of those trailers, you've probably, if you've passed up that way, you'll notice they all have blue tarps on them. Um, and so we're hoping to see if we can uh, figure out a way to get uh, roofing done on those. Uh, the community pool, which we all love and enjoy around here, has not been working since before uh, Ian, just before Ian. Uh, and that, uh, the commissioner informed us the, at the last meeting, um, they have two valves that needed replacing. Those valves will be once they have been replaced, it was supposed to be happening sometime this week, they will be checked and our pool will reopen. Um, so when, I don't know yet, mm -hmm. but uh, it will be soon. Sooner rather than later. Um, there's a 4.75 acre parcel that has been set aside for temporary housing. Again, this is all stuff that happens at the Pine Island Alliance um, on the island, uh, thanks to a local realtor. I believe she's here tonight, Paula. Yeah, Paula, if you'll stand up there. Yes, she's uh, offering this land up so that it can be used for uh, trailers or, or, you know, mobile homes, whatever you call them. Um, and FEMA is coordinating with the county to have the inspections done to sort of fast track the implementation of those uh, trailers. Um, FEMA, by the way, is also encouraging residents to visit the FEMA tent to reopen claims that may have been previously uh, denied. You need to go back to that tent. If you've had a claim and it's been denied, you need to go back and revisit it, refile your claim so that uh, otherwise it's over. But uh, it, it can be, you know, brought back. Uh, I can't answer any questions, but FEMA will be here uh, so they can. Uh, the Matt Lachey housing and businesses that are sitting in water, this was something that Mike Hannon had brought up at the, uh, and asked a question about, um, will be helped via the um, Ian Debris Cleanup Program. Uh, property owners need to fill out a private property application on the website, but uh, they're, uh, through barges, et cetera, they are going to remove those and uh, individual property owners won't be accountable for that. Um, the one thing that the GPIA, the Greater Pine Island Alliance, needs is volunteers. Because it's all people just showing up and helping out, whether it's cleaning up a roadway or handing out, uh, you know, drywall and plywood. And both Aaron and Jay are going to be here at the end of the meeting. And if you have any interest in helping out your community, those are the two people you should speak to. Can you just raise your hands, guys, so they know who to look for? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Now to the central business of tonight's meeting. We have invited county staff to take your questions and to hear your comments. And in order to give as much time as possible to your issues, we've asked just two of the invitees to give us a very brief update on what they've been doing for Greater Pine Island. But first, I'd like the staff to stand and wave as I call their names, so just so you'll know who's here. So Lee County Commissioner Kevin Ruane, all right. Assistant County Manager Glenn Salyer, and other Lee County Administrators Mark Mora, and Dave Harner. 
uh, the, the director of the Lee Department of Transportation, Randy Searchy, is here. All right, great. The Director of Community Development, Dave Loveland, is here. The Lee, a Lee County Building Official, I'm not sure if Sean McNulty got here, thank you. And Director of Solid Waste, Doug Whitehead. And Lee County Utilities, Paul Flores. Did I miss anybody? Okay, I know there are other people here, from FEMA especially, um, but um, I will let the, uh, 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 we'll figure out who's here uh, when you have questions. If you have a question for a FEMA person, that person will stand up and introduce themselves. <coughs> so as you can see by their titles, our county staff are ready to address our concerns about such matters as road reconstruction, planning, zoning, rebuilding, construction standards, permitting, waste removal, flood insurance rates, park and re parks and recreations, and plenty more. So we'll begin with an update from Lee County Commissioner Kevin Ruane. This will be followed by a brief message uh, from the Assistant County Manager Glenn Sawyer after which we will take questions and comments from the floor. So, Commissioner Ruane, would you kindly come up and give us an update? Thank you. First and foremost, uh, I missed last month's meeting. That's on me. There was an email sent to my office. Um, I missed the email. Um, human being, I missed it. I own it. I apologize. But since then, I met Aaron and Jay. Um, they have an alliance meeting. I've been here every week. I'll continue to make sure I'm here every week to answer whatever questions, whatever needs you have. It's easy to come here with staff to address the issues that we have in front of us. And it's been a busy situation because my district, um, and I'm not making excuses, just telling you the facts, is the most impacted district in Lee County. It starts at Captiva, Upper Captiva, Sanibel, Southwest Cape, Pine Island and Boca Grand, by far the most devastated part of Lee County, to say the least. Um, on top of that, to work with the legislator as well as um, DC, there's been a desire to have a centralization where the county is there to represent the entire county. So they asked that we follow what took place in Hurricane Michael. And during Hurricane Michael, Bay County put together a task force that would represent the entire Bay County. So you're representing the same structure in Lee County in the six cities. So unincorporated Lee County as well as incorporated Lee County. And to do that, um, the Board of County Commissioners elected me to be chairman. What that does is streamline the process in asking and advocating up in Tallahassee. So there was a special session shortly after my appointment, and during the special session, we asked for many things that we're gonna to have to deal with. The first of everyone's concern has been debris. Um, unprecedented situation with Governor DeSantis where he has actually gotten involved in moving debris that he normally wouldn't, but we as a state has never done or a county. And what's important about that is it, it was approved by FEMA for the first 75 days for 100% reimbursement. Thereafter, it goes to a 75-25 split, where 25 cents gets split between the state and the county. I can tell you at the amount of debris that we have to pick up, that could almost bankrupt the county. Um, so fortunately, when we were up to special session, the legislators approved that they would pay the entire 25%. So we have no cost whatsoever. So during the special session, when I gave testimony, and met with many legislators, both on the House and the Senate, we got that through. So we don't have to worry about any type of cost associated with debris. Um, it's unprecedented for us to not only pick up vegetation, but construction debris is not something we normally do. So that's important. We're trying to allocate the resources as quickly as we can. Rest assured that we will continue to make sure uh, the debris gets picked up. And one of the reasons that we have someone from Solid Waste is to identify, and what people have done is if you identify the various streets, 
or various issues you have, it's easy for me to go to our solid waste director, been very responsive, we'll get back to you. Um, I have the opportunity to work with our waste hauler to understand exactly what the issues are and address the concern. The second issue during um, the legislative session was the governor has given a rebate which will be sent back to you taxpayers on property taxes. So the event took place on September 28th and your tax bill is one that is broken down between building and land. Um, what he basically passed is any substantially damaged homes from September 28th or theoretically the last quarter would receive zero value for the building portion and would rebate that one quarter of whatever your tax bill is. So if you have $500,000 in building, $500,000 in land, he would rebate $125,000, whatever that prorated share of taxes are. He'll do the same in 23, um, and that comes from the state's coffers. The problem with that is we've passed our budget, so we have a revenue issue where we're without that revenue, so the legislator passed a bill to allow us to actually get revenue replacement. That was another thing during session, to allow the municipalities, um, especially the smaller municipalities, the opportunity to continue to operate and perform the services that you require. Um, third, um, up in Tallahassee, we dealt with property insurance and flood reform. Um, there are many issues associated with um, a lot of lawsuits and a lot of litigation. Florida represents more than 80% of the litigation when it comes to insurance claims. So they put a lot of tort reform associated with that. It was really at the governor's request, and that went through as well during the special session. So the only meeting that I certainly was unable to attend since I made the obligation to be here was that meeting on Tuesday when I was up in Tallahassee. Um, and the total of what we were able to accomplish is Lee County received over $750 million of appropriations in that session. Um, I've also been asked to testify next week on what Lee County's next needs are. I'm um, trying to work with all the municipalities. I'll testify next Wednesday and next Thursday uh, to make sure we continue to have representation, to make sure we continue to have the funding that's needed. Um, I asked for this job, and I'll make one promise, I'm not going anyplace. Um, I was affected just like you were in the storm. Uh, we had a house in Sanibel that I'm scraping. Um, it's just a fact of life. I'm fortunate to have another home and live in. So I understand some of the trials and tribulations you've all gone through, and uh, I'll make one commitment that I, I won't go away. Um, I'll be here. Um, that's my word, and my word is my bond. I'm old school. That's the way Dad raised me. Um, and as far as any other issues, we've tried to address, and what I like about the Greater Pine Island, and I've had an opportunity to meet both Aaron and Jay, is the issues that come up. You know, so you ask for permitting. Okay, you want permitting on the island. Within a week, we had it staged and ready to go. Um, you asked for the pool to be reopened, and we made sure the valves had been ordered, and as soon as they're in, we're gonna open the pool. Um, you asked for a debris site to actually have a central location. Again, as soon as we did that on a weekly basis, we're able to respond. Uh, I was just working with, where is, yes. gentleman from, um, Department of Emergency Management. Where is he? Hi. Hi. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, you're, you're, you want to come up? You at our meeting, you're an attorney, right? Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So um, we've identified some spots, um, and the department has actually been trying to look at where there's opportunities to. Um, use some of the sites, um, not only for debris, but also for housing. So working in conjunction and honestly, I've worked with local people. Uh, we did ask Kevin to come here, uh, Guthrie, just because we want to make sure you're represented. Uh, so I appreciate you coming very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so, you know, that has transpired as well. So again, as we understand the needs, we try to react as quickly as we can. I think what you've done is really magnificent because you've put together your organizations and I represent a lot of different areas and no one has weekly meetings where you sit down and have an agenda and you talk about the issues and you have people from Department of Emergency Management there, you have people from FEMA 
SBA. I mean, so we're all trying to respond and react to this situation as quickly as you can. Um, I can't thank the governor and his support in so many things that he has done. Um, he continues to respond and, and outperform. Uh, one of the things I always laugh about is that at the rec right he works. So unfortunately, the county, I can't work as fast as he does. Um, and that's really a good thing. You watch the bridge go through in three days. You watch the Sanibel Causeway be built in three weeks. Um, it sets the bar pretty high to try to do this. But um, that's the overview. I didn't really want to take too much time. There's a lot of questions. And that was most important that I wanted to address the questions. I've been given a glossary of questions, starting with trailers. And I think it would be only appropriate if the FEMA people would come on up. Because we've tried to, through the Greater Alliance, identify tracks um, that we found not to be in a flood zone. So um, when someone talked about the five acre track, that worked out and that was really the result of uh, the interaction we had with the Alliance. There was a 44 acre uh, site that we're looking at and we're gonna work through some of the streamlined processes. But we understand the need for housing and I do believe that FEMA has been more than responsive. They've been at every weekly meeting. We're trying to unturn any particular area. So when it comes to any type of trailers or any type of things, the th requirements are A, that we keep you out of a flood zone. We don't put a trailer back in a flood zone. There's specific prohibitions to that. So we found many pieces of property that at least are, we have to go through the due diligence, make sure they have water, sewer, and electric. Um, so we're going through that process. So the first item that I've been asked to speak about was trailers, and I think it would only be appropriate that FEMA and certainly the state um, that have worked really closely on those issues, because from a housing and a, a trailer point of view, that is really beyond my scope. What we've done as a county, state, and the federal have worked together in concert, um, and it's really been a collaboration that I'm proud to see that everyone respond to everyone's needs. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to Bob. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Bob Fogel uh, from FEMA. I'm the Deputy Federal Recording Officer for Hurricane Ian. Um, I always like to give you the numbers and where the status is, so I'll give you that. Before I do, I want to make sure everybody knows and that you please help us spread the word that the deadline to apply for FEMA assistance, if you haven't already, or if you know anybody that hasn't, is January 12th. That's Thursday. So they must apply by midnight or else they will not be considered for FEMA assistance. Um, so far, uh, up about $2 million from the last time I was here, $22 million in total um, individual household programs provided to residents of Pine Island and Met Lache, as well as $18 million in homeowners assistance for repairs and $3 million in rental assistance. What you may not know, a little known fact, is that in Lee County, 2,000 people have received what we call the max, maximum grant, which is $37,900 for their structure and $37,900 for the contents of their home. That's $75,000. Many of those are residents of Pine Island. Um, we couldn't do this without the state and without the county's partnership. They have been phenomenal. Yesterday I was out at the Beacon of Hope, which is part of the Alliance, uh, and we were doing a training for many of the volunteers from here on the island. We had the state there, we had SBA, we had county representatives there to help train the volunteers that are working with and talking to people on the ground to help them advocate for themselves with all of us, the state, the county, uh, and of course FEMA for, for resources. As the commissioner mentioned, this is a catastrophic event um, and we are doing things that we have never done before that are extraordinary. The governor pushed hard and we responded to do this, what's called commercial and private debris removal in the catastrophic areas of the disaster. Um, that has gone well. Uh, Doug, you probably have the right number, but I'm told 26 million, dollar cubic, 26 million cubic yards and over 12 million cubic yards in Lee County, um, the rough, uh, sense of what that is, is you could fill the Heinz, uh, uh, the Hart, Hart Stadium almost 12 times from, from bottom to top, um, as, as that's how much it is. And if we had a debris pile, it'd go from here to Minneapolis and back uh, to Pine Island. Um, so that's where we are. In terms of trailers, this is where we currently are. Um, the most important thing is we have a couple people already on the island, which isn't many, that have a trailer, and we have 10 that are um, work orders for being licensed in in the next couple weeks. 
As an extraordinary measure, the governor and his representatives, the floodplain manager of the state, as well as the county, we have worked with the county, the emergency management, the floodplain managers of every municipality to get what we call a temporary uh, permit to allow us to put travel trailers and not have those travel trailers if they are in certain floodplain zones, AE and other zones, and I have my floodplain manager to explain that if you have questions, to allow that without raising them to the base flood elevation on a very temporary basis. We still have all housing options available, which includes direct lease, which we can do to work on commercial sites. We have one, one commercial uh, set of site pads that we are very close to contracting on Pine Island. We already had one group site that we had identified that is still being developed on Pine Island, and the, the Greater Pine Island Alliance and FDEM has identified it. two other locations. One is actively in development right now, thanks to the Greater Pine Island Alliance identifying that to us, and a, and a second one is a possible one right behind that, so three potential. We also have a um, trailer park just off of Pine Island on the Cape Coral side, just over the causeway. Um, that is close to being contracted in with over 100 pads that may be available. Uh, so we are working this every single day. I tell my team every day we're not done, and you have a roof over your head. It may be a FEMA trail that you're sleeping at out to the airport, but it's a roof, and a lot of folks do not have those out here, so we will keep pushing to get that done until we are done. I, too, have been here since the beginning of the disaster. I will be here throughout the rest of this year into the summer and my entire team. We now have about 200 in Lee County and 1,600 in uh, Tampa and Orlando that are working this disaster. The most heavily hit part of the entire disaster, two-thirds of the housing mission, is in one, line, one county. That is Lee County. And in Lee County, it is Pine Island. So we will continue to work as best we can to get folks what they need and the needs they have to recover. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Ke Kevin, I'm wondering if we want to take some questions from the floor on the, on the issue of housing. Sure. Um, I'm not quite sure how oh, you would like to that, go through fine. the questions fine, you Helen. have. I mean, I'd love to try to address each topic and the main topic and address the questions because obviously, the only way this is going to work is we work in unison, not only with the state, but the feds. So whatever questions come up, that's why it's important for us to bring the appropriate personnel here to try to address the questions. And honestly, the quicker we understand an issue, the quicker we could at least try to address the problem. So yeah. I'd like so, to go in that order. If yeah. we can, you gave me five or six topics. I just figured we'd cover each topic until there are questions obviously been answered, and we'll move on to the next topic. Okay, so, well, let's try it. Okay. Because there might th be things outside of our topics that we've, we haven't thought of. Uh, so, uh, if you have questions about housing, about trailers, about uh, FEMA, about tiny houses, about uh, uh, places to live, about people that you know who are um, not housed right now or not housed appropriately, Now's the time to come up and voice your question or just make a comment. Okay, come on up if you, yeah. Just come on up and Kevin will hand you the microphone. Yeah, yeah you're gonna need the microphone. I'm not speaking for myself, I'm speaking for my sister who can't be here tonight. But her house was demolished, and she's down in, she's down in St. James, and um, she's been having a very hard time getting help cleaning her house out so that she can get on to, with the process. Uh, uh, is there someone that she specifically should call and, you know, that's going to help her get these people? She said what, they came for four hours one day to help her clear out a three-level house. You know, and, she and that's just, not enough. And, and so. she's debilitated. She can't do that herself. Yeah. Um, would members of the alliance like to speak to that? Um, Team at gpialliance.org. Team. 
uh, at gpialliance.org. Can I say something as well? Yes, of course. Hello, hello. Okay, my name is David Stackpole. I'm here on behalf of All Hands and Hearts. We're a volunteer organization. Just met with Aaron the other day to figure out how we can partner on Pine Island, but we have teams out here doing the muck and guts, doing the mold sanitation, debris removal. So we have a bunch of flyers with us today um, in English and in Spanish um, for residents who are Spanish speaking. But yeah, we're working with Aaron to figure out how we can be long-term partners on the island. But as I said, yeah, we got teams out here uh, coming on a week-to-week -week basis. So. Our teams are also available. That number is also available. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the, our intake number is 239-372-0721. Uh, you just leave your name and your information, and then we'll get out to assess your home and see how we can help. So that's the system we got going there. Oh, yep, muck and gut, mold sanitation, debris removal are the services we provide, all free of charge. Uh, we're a volunteer group, so that's the system. All right, this gentleman here. Um, we got another. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Pine Island Baptist Church just Thank got a group coming in that made a three to five year commitment to help restore after FEMA, Red Cross, everybody's gone. They'll clean out your houses, they'll evaluate it. If you lost insurance, no FEMA money, they'll help rebuild your house. If it's demoed, they might actually tear it down and build you a house back. It might not be the size that you had, but there are Mennonites and a lot of Christian groups that have come in from around the United States that I personally know helped rebuild Katrina, Pine Island Baptist Church, talked to the pastor. That group is stationed there now, and they made a three to five year commitment to Pine Island. Wow. Yes, yes, Pine Island Baptist. So on that note, um, my name is Simone Monaco. I am here representing the United Methodist Conference. We also are doing disaster relief. We also will be here for three to four years. Um, we have case managers who are stationed here at this church Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Um, I will have a sign-up list out back if you want to put your sister's name and number, and we will give her a call this week and see if we can get out there and help her muck and gut her house um, just we will be here all week, um, well, for the next three to four years, but I will be here today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments on the issue of housing? If you could stand up, if you've okay. got a question, then I can yeah. come get you. Mm -hmm. So I am interested to, um, as to the trailers, how long that you're going to allow for the trailers to be, whether it be in a particular site that you have um, picked or whether it be like on their home site, how long are you going to allow these temporary trailers to be on these sites? Yeah, so it, it depends on where you are in the flood zone on the island, right? So we cannot put trailers in what's called a vector zone or a floodway zone. Uh, if you are in the special uh, flood hazard area, high coastal high hazard area, um, this temporary program would allow it to be there for 180 days or August 1st, whichever comes first. Then you would be eligible for other direct housing, which could be a commercial site or a group site, which typically take longer to develop, or direct lease departments or multifamily uh, home and repair. So, so the, that, that, and then if there are other sites that you are eligible, and some of the trailers here are, uh, the elevations on some part of the islands are high enough to elevate appropriately to what's called the base flood elevation, those would be eligible to remain FEMA trailers now uh, up to 18 months from the date of disaster. So March of 2024, I believe. Hello. Um, so I have a friend who, I ha own a piece of property out here and we did not flood. And his trailer got completely smacked and I'm currently allowing him to live in our place. We're sharing our, our mobile home with him on our property. We've, I've assisted him in applying for, uh, through Unite to get a trailer. And he uh, recently was rejected 
or um, it was canceled. Um, I spoke with Glenn over there and he said that there was uh, some cases where if you have like transportation assistance and you've asked for housing assistance, such as a trailer, that sometimes they can get canceled. So that's an issue um, that, that I need to figure out how to address. And the other thing is if I'm putting a FEMA trailer on my personal property, do, is there permitting issues that need to happen or anything like that if it's, if it's just a personal property? So I think the first part of your question may be a state, uh, for the state non-congregate sheltering program, which is the six month from day to disaster, although I know they've um, requested an extension of that. So I don't know if the state wants to take that. While she's coming up, I can answer the second question. I'm not sure I understand the fact pattern. Another thing I forgot to mention, just like the last time, we have um, our, some of our most expert folks that do uh, FEMA uh, individual case and case management, they're out in the lobby. So if anybody has specific questions about your personal case, you can go out there and they will try to work with you and understand what's going on in your personal instance and try to help you figure out what to do. So for a trailer, um, so it wasn't clear to me whether this was um, a trailer that was permitted. So the permitting happens through the county, Lee County, and that would be the setbacks. It would also be a, a building permit uh, that would be signed off for the floodplain manager for a FEMA trailer for the individual for their private site. Now, there is the possibility if their private site, let's say, is in a vector zone, let's say it's, it's ineligible by FEMA to put it in a vector zone or a flood lake because that's where their property was, there is a provision for them uh, to put a FEMA trailer and request it to be put on an alternate site. So when I was down at Fort Myers Beach talking to the mayor there, he had asked if it was possible if somebody else had a house on the island and a large driveway or a large lot that wasn't planning to use their house, if they were to lease their property to someone else for let's say a dollar a month for 18 months to allow somebody to put a trailer, that, that could be eligible as an, what we call an alternate site to put a FEMA trailer on that site. The requirement would be a legal liability release and a right of entry release to be able to go out and install it. So, so I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question because I'm yeah, not I've sure. Yeah, I've already I filled out all those papers for the liability release and the for from, you, for from the you home or for as, as, for as you to be, be the alternate site. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yes. So, 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 and you can check with me afterwards. We can sure. find your individual case, but. It, I, it sounds like you, somebody fi figured out how to get, uh, and you were really willing, and what's, by the way, thank you, um, that's huge, that's um, a to allow thing. somebody to, to use your property as an alternate site, which is what I think you're talking about. Yes. Hi, um, so I'm the general counsel for the state, and so I don't know the specifics, but my understanding is it was a glitch in the system, and now it's been addressed and resolved. So she, can, she or he can go ahead and reapply, and it shouldn't be an issue. But after this, if you want to get with me, um, I can make sure I put you with the appropriate folks who can make sure it's not an issue again. So that person would have to go back onto the Unite Florida and reapply all the way from the beginning again? Or would that make a duplicate so let me get with United, United after this and yeah. try to understand um, what the issue was and if some of the information was saved. I'm not quite sure, but I know that we can fix it, whatever it is. So. Okay. Thank you. Ian Recovery at fl.gov. Ian Recovery at fl.gov. And the 1 800 number is 1 800 892 0948. I can repeat it. It's 1 800 892 0948. The website again, Ian Recovery. Ian Recovery fl.gov. Okay, so are there any other questions um, regarding housing 
There's one right there. Here at the Beacon of Hope, and we've been enrolling people. We've been enrolling people in Unite Florida for a couple, I don't know. It seems like forever, but I guess it's just about six weeks. And we've had a lot of success in resolving problems. So we have a fair amount of experience. So anybody who's having issues with Unite Florida, um, you might want to come down to the Beacon Monday, Wednesday, Friday from nine to three. Um, again, we've had a fair amount of experience helping people um, resolve problems, and we recognize problems because they've happened to all of the people that we've worked with. Also, this is not a housing issue, but I want to say that, as uh, Mr. Fogel mentioned, there's a lot of money. There's 39.7 available, or 37.9 available from FEMA for housing repair, also for unmet needs. And apparently a lot of people have gotten the full compliment, but if you haven't, appeal. Come down to the Beacon, we will help you appeal it. We're gonna make you work for it. You're gonna to have to gather the facts to support a claim, but let's appeal it. Let's get more money on Pine Island, okay? Thank you. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions on housing, we'll move on to the next issue. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah. Super. Um, the next issue, I'm just going to go a little out of order to make sure we address seems to be some dire issues, debris removal. So as I'd indicated before, debris removal, we um, have worked closely with the state to make sure it'll be reimbursed 100% um, as we wait for FEMA's determination because they've only approved us for 75 days. So we're continuing to pick up anything that's put out. Questions? Hi, I'm in Flamingo Bay. A uh, couple problems. Number one, they don't seem to be picking up the black plastic bags. I'd made a suggestion to FEMA months ago that um, everybody's got black plastic bags. I know there was something that we're supposed to put it in clear, but they're not available usually. It, can, we, can we do a simple thing of putting a white X over, you know, with spray paint over top of the plastic bags to indicate that they're storm removal versus trash? Ma'am, the issue is one of safety. We don't know what's in the bag when it's put there, um, and we can't pick it up. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of just the way it is. So unfortunately, we can pick it up as MSW. If people have an issue, they can contact Lee County Solid Waste um, the, on the website and their email or the 1-800 number, which is 800, which is 239-533-8000. Uh, and we can get out there, but it cannot be picked up as debris. If, it, if the material can be unbagged, it has to be. Um, it's, it's just a safety issue. We just don't know what's in that bag, and it has to go to the appropriate location. Okay. Is there a way to get more clear plastic bags available to people immediately after disasters like this? Because if you're talking installation and, and that type of removal, you need to put it into something or it's going to keep blowing everywhere and there's just not clear, large, heavy-duty plastic bags available. Yes, ma'am. I mean, you can get some from, again, charity organizations right now. I mean, it's, it's 110 days after the hurricane, obviously, right now but they can be found through charity organizations. And of course, we do have some. And if, again, if you contact 533-8000, we can help residents get the clear plastic bags. Obviously, most of the material is, is larger, so, it's, uh, so we are continuing to pick up material in the street. Okay. The other question is refrigerator removal. Um, they just came this last week and they removed most of the refrigerators on Flamingo Drive and Flamingo Bay. However, they didn't remove, there was three on the lot next to me. They removed two of them and didn't remove the third. I actually chased them down and told them about it, said they were gonna come back. They haven't. Is that gonna be the same number I have to call to get them to come back for that refrigerator? You can call that, but that brings up the larger question is that, for instance, we've picked up essentially 850,000 cubic yards and about off the island 
and several thousand appliances off the island will be coming back. That's really the message I want to say is we're continuing coming back. You can use that one, the, the 533 number to notify us, but we do have inspectors on the island. Um, I'm on the island uh, one day a week, look, you know, looking at places like Creamer and Hibiscus and Basilla just yesterday, but we will be coming back. Um, the appliances are picked up separately, of course, from the general um, structure demolition debris. And I appreciate that. I just want to make sure that the third one goes because it was 50 foot from everything else and it didn't make any sense. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Just to okay, follow up, so if, there are, if there is trash in black bags, should people be unbagging that stuff and just putting it on the curb? What, what are we if, supposed if to do? If it's garbage, for instance, people did use black, black plastic bags for um, things they took out of the refrigerator, which I hope are gone by now. But if that's the case, I don't recommend unbagging it. Just tell us what's in, in the bag and we'll have an inspector come out. Having said that, if they can um, unbag it, that's good because generally uh, debris is picked up loose if it's demolition material on the side of the road. So demolition material, sure, unbag it, but if it's food, they put it in their trash can and put it out at the curb? Yes. Perfect. If everyone heard that, if you have just regular garbage, you can put it out at the curb as part of regular garbage collection. Thank you. I have three questions, and not really questions. Doug, we're on a good thing on something else. We're not going to discuss the avenue. Could you speak up, uh, sir? Thank you. I got two positives that I got to work with you through Kevin. One is 17 acres that I got a client that's willing to let me clear it at my expense for y'all to use as a dump site over by the fire department. Kevin, Glenn, they know about it. I'm supposed to get with you. They don't want no money for it. They're willing to let you use it. I just got to go there and mulch a bunch of trees at my expense for you to get in there. And then we got a 17-acre dump site instead of this little eyesore that's causing stress mm -hmm. for everybody. We can get with that. I'll be um, frank right now is that actually Pine Island is one of the easiest places to get around on. And our site, as you know, is right off Stringfellow, I guess just past the VFW across from, gosh, you, you, well, everyone knows where it is here, right? Yeah. No, so I mean, for you that, to do this out yeah. of. So the question is, do we need it? Because we do, if we use a site, we have to clean it up and bring it back to its original state afterwards. No, just leave it. it I clear it down. It'll be, if there's debris, make sure it's gone. If it's household debris, just make sure it's gone. But you can use it. You don't want no money. Do a contract, and I'll prep it and get it ready for you. But we can discuss that afterwards. Yes, sir. The other thing is, the one woman mentioned clear back bags, well, it's 180 days, but a lot of our residents on this island are snowbirds. They just got here, it's January. They're just now starting to clean their houses and they don't know. They're going off of what they see on the street. Storm cleanup with the debris. We need clarification of what's legit, what's not legit and how to do things. It ain't fair to somebody to see what's been done for three months and then all of a sudden somebody d decide to say, oh, well, that person wasn't doing their job and monitoring it right. We need clarification now to pass it around so the abuse, the fraud, and the uneducated are educated on what you want for the island to, d to do right. Absolutely, and we'll work with both the association and we can also use targeted social media. We have the ability to actually target certain areas of the county with, with messaging, uh, I'll, I'll say is that demolition material like and household goods that have been damaged should be in one pile. Obviously, vegetation should be another because it's treated separately. And if you have appliances, that's fourth, a third pile. And then the fourth pile would be any hazardous waste. I mean, we've actually picked up, like I said, 74 tons of household hazardous waste uh, on the island and disposed the of. The clarification of what storm debris you know, uh, storm debris. FEMA says storm debris is a broken tree. Well, you got somebody that's got an acre, a half acre, a residential lot, and it doesn't have a house on it. 90% of it's storm debris, trees laid over that are a danger. The customer wants it gone. We can do that, and we're going to develop. We have some FAQs that are online, but we can push them out again. For instance, I think a great point is, is again, um, what we call leaners and hangers, which are damaged trees. 
essentially we only remove um, leaders and hangers that are, are considered a safety hazard to the public. We and also, for instance, we cannot go into people's property. We're pretty much a right of way only you operation. Can, but the customer bringing out their storm debris to the property to the right of way to get picked up. What's considered storm debris? FEMA says if it's destroyed, leaning, dead, broken, it's storm debris. It can come to the road. The avenue is a perfect example. It was 99.9% .9 storm debris. To get it off of Stringfellow so you don't have the bicycles, the bus stop that's there, and the traffic with hangers coming down and dead trees that are compromised with the root system, you got to push it back to D Avenue. Well, D Avenue's compromised. You don't want to stack all that on Stringfellow and block the sidewalk for our people that still think that there's not a storm zone and want to ride their bicycles every day. So we clean up D Avenue, its debris to stack it, and then it's considered, well, that's land clearing. Well, you if, got a piece of pie like this, and when everything's gone, it looks like it's cleared, but it wasn't. But besides that, just education of every single lot on this island, you're saying if it's not developed, you can't put the storm debris out. That's correct. We do not, we can't accept, unless it's overhanging, um, Leah said, like a sidewalk or a road, on undeveloped lots, we cannot collect material from undeveloped lots in the county because that's taken away from, obviously, as you walk or go around the island, all the other material that's out there, places like Cherry Lane, we can't pick up material from undeveloped lots unless it's a safety issue. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, sir. Hello. Like this young lady said, if I understood you right with the black bags, the phone calls to be made, and when you approve, after we tell you what's in the bag, you come and get it. Is that correct? We're going to have to get the regular garbage hauler to come get it, which would be Waste Pro on the island. Because we I, just don't I, I know what's in it, and it's treated as municipal solid I, waste. I understand like garbage. that. I'm on several projects, and uh, the, the contractor bags, if you will, are durable. And if we were to mark them with white paint, you'd know what's in them without the hassle. I'll just say is that we just can't pick it up. I, I apologize. I wish, but if you call us, we'll find a way to get, get the black bags. But it cannot be picked up by Dotson which is the subcontractor I think y'all are familiar with. It would have to be picked up by the garbage Just tear contractor. the bag open. <laughs> that would be a good way. I'm not sure if this is applicable at this point, but we have a home across the street from us on Mat Lache that was hit by a twister and it was severely damaged. There's no roof. It looks like a Barbie doll house. You can see all the way to the kitchen to the next canal. Those people who own that house do not live in the United States. And we have been texting them and WhatsApping them and we're, they are telling us that they found a contractor, but he can't get a permit to demo that home. So I'm asking you, is there a permit for demoing a home? Okay, perfect. Thank you. There's a woman over here on the far side. If it's okay, she's been had her hand up for a while over there. Front, it might be quicker. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait. If you'd hold up, um, just a second. I'm sorry, I'll be back. Okay. How do you dispose of a gas can that got water in or a propane canister that was floating around in the water after the storm? Again, you can contact us. It's treated, it would be treated as household hazardous waste. And we have a separate, we have the prime contractor, which is Prouder Gulf, and they have a subcontractor will come pick it up. Again, 533-8000 can get that done. Yes, ma'am. This is actually is for the commissioner. Probably you would know better than anybody. 
higher. All right. <laughs> Who's cleaning out our canals? A um, couple different companies. The states actually have a state mission to clean out the canals. I haven't seen a canal cleaned yet. Who do we contact? Who do we get? Hi again. Um, so it depends on who maintains the canal and if there's a re request by the municipality or the county. Um, so I would presume it's probably us at some point um, and we'll, we'll, we'll just need to get some more information after this meeting as to um, where the canals are located and what's in the canals and we'll get our contractors um, under the DEP contract. Are they going to come in and assess what's in them? I mean, it's soup to nuts in those canals. There's yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, so mo most of these uh, post-storm emergency contracts have most of those line items. So if they don't, we can work on that. But um, they'll remove the canal, the debris from the canals, and even. Mm -hmm. Ian Debris Cleanup, correct? Is that? Dot com. Yes. Ian Debris Cleanup dot com. Is that the on the uh, by the blue dog? Is that on the sign? Oh, doing it. Oh. Okay, there, I see two more hands. There, there, there's a gentleman that's gonna go a little bit longer that I know he's doing it. You know, uh, Nadine, it might be easier if, if you just put the microphone here and then we have people line up. People could, you know, if you have a question, just come line up Ma'am. Ma on that particular topic. Uh, my name's Casey Streeter, I own Island Seafood and we're handling the contract Mant Lachey South into St. James and back over to Flamingo Bay. So we are working those areas. We've finished with Matt Lachey uh, for the most part, and we're getting all the, the navigable hazards out of the channels uh, and the canal systems. So I'm not sure where you're at, but. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Now we're, 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 we're working on it. We're seven days a week. So in our, our collection site in St. James is at Monroe Canal. So. We will be in that side. We're uh, on the Cherry Estate side right now because there's a lot of debris, and we're just about finished with that side with the big stuff. So, no, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure we will be there, though. I promise. Yeah, following up on the same topic, I'm, there's boats and canals in Mat Lachey, but also Mat Lachey Pass has sunken mm -hmm. boats. The mangroves yeah. are full of derelict boats and was wondering whose responsibility it is to clean them or to remove them and when that might happen because mm -hmm. they're just still leaching all kinds of nasty things into the water. Uh, yes, ma'am. So I apologize for that confusion. We're ha handling a couple different um, counties and some have re requested that our contractors do the canals. Others have not. So it just depends on the local municipalities or the the local um, counties actually uh, requesting the state's assistance. With that being said, for derelict vessels, um, and it's a very um, convoluted topic, but but I'll try to keep it like as, as surface level as possible. So anything that statutorily um, is considered a derelict vessel, so that there's a state water nexus, that's under the FWC contract, and um, the FWC officials are currently tagging those um, and determining Get it, collecting those waivers and giving the due process, which is 21 days, then there was a 45 additional day, and then they extended it just because they wanted to make sure everyone who you know was unfortunately um, impacted by this event was able to um, obtain their property and claim it back if they wanted to, in fact, do so. Um, for the mangroves, that's more our DEP contract, so they're currently, um, and, and that for Lee County is Ashbrit. Um, they're working on assessing those vessels right now in the mangroves, and you know we want to just make sure we're doing it appropriately. We want to absolutely prevent any type of um, leak or anything that's that's causing hazard, hazardous materials to be um, leaked into the environment. That needs to be reported immediately, and we need to address that. But for the vessels, and I know that there are a lot of them, all of our con contractors are working really hard um, <clears throat> in partnership with FWC, DEP, and DEM to remove all those vessels. So we're working on it. We understand it's an issue. We had a due process right that we had to comply with statutorily. Um, I've been working with the general counsel for the FWC to make sure we're compliant, but we're not um, 
slowing down efforts. We, we want to make sure we're, we're doing what we have to do statutorily, but we're also res responding appropriately. So um, you'll, you should see a significant increase. We're getting a lot of those waiver packets in now. Um, so between the derelict vessels and just vessels not in uh, state waters, we're, we're working on it. Okay, are we ready to go on to the next issue? Oh, go, come on, Isla. Okay, uh, my question is specifically about uh, permitting. So, Speak up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, it's specifically about permitting. Sure. I'll, I'll come back. No problem. <laughs> Any other debris? Okay, one question. Clarification, we live in Boquilla, we uh, live on a canal, residents have cleaned out trees and other debris that we can see, there are no vessels. We know there's a lot of damage and um, soffits, fascia, all kinds of stuff in the canal. Is there any effort, is there going to be somebody coming by all canals on the island and scoping it or scanning it or cleaning it out or do we just assume that uh, if we don't hit something, we're okay. Yes, ma'am. So uh, crews will be along to clean those waterways. It, uh, it is a very complicated mission between the state, the county, um, and various agencies within each of those groups. But for what you're describing with construction and demolition debris in a channel, we will be by to clean that up. It's just that will ultimately take some time, of course. We'll never know when that's going to happen because somebody, somebody will be assessing all of the canals. That's correct. I can't give you a timetable for each one, but it absolutely is going to happen. So uh, for county canals and drainage ditches, it's either DOT or natural resources. It depends on the conveyance. So if you have some specific uh, waterways that you want us to look at, get with me after the meeting and we can get some additional information for you. So this is mostly a follow-up to the question of vegetative debris. Yes, no, is it something else, something that's not gonna be considered? So there's a vacant lot next to, across the street from mine. It's already caught fire once, it's gonna catch fire again. Um, Nothing's being done. There's a lot of vacant lots. There's also, sadly, a lot of houses that, um, because people live out of the country or in another part of the country or are simply emotionally overwhelmed and can't deal with it, um, probably won't in the amount of time that you would deem is acceptable. When it comes to both vacant lots that are not being maintained as well as those unfortunate dwellings that will not be demoed by permit, um, or at least by the owner, what's the timeline for neighbors and what's the appropriate course of action? So if I can sell, uh, separate, separate that, uh, the first question is empty lots. I mean, unimproved lots. And unfortunately, is that unless there is a safety issue, which if you can, and you can call us or you can call, um, uh, you just call us if there's a safety issue and we can evaluate that. We do things like clean up, um, you know, lots which have, you know, hoarding issues and stuff like that. But it has to be a safety issue. But in general, we will not remove material from unimproved lots. Again, we can't go on to people's property. We can only pick up along the right of way. Um, and, and that's the second issue is that um, if the house is, is going to, if the, if the owner can't afford to demo the house themselves, they have to go on in, you know, in debris, um, what's, the, what's the third word? In debris cleanup.com where they'll, where they can work with the state to bring someone on to clean up the house if they can't afford it. Um, and that, that's sort of right now because what the county is doing is right of way cleanup. Obviously there's a huge amount of that still, but as stuff moves to the curb, we can get it. Hi, Sean McNulty, DCD. Um, to answer your question in the shortest way possible, yes, 
the county has a will most likely be an unsafe building process. It is due process. We have to attempt to notify those property owners and uh, give them proper amount of time to abate. But if not, that yeah, there's a process where the county comes in and hires contractors to do the demo. And you know we've been involved in that and actually doing the cleanup. And I will say it takes a, it takes a while. It really does take a while if the homeowner is not managing their own property. Are there any other questions about debris, either in the water or no? If it can be reached from the right of way, the county will, can remove it. Again, that it's a safety and it's a safety hazard. Yes, sir. Okay, are we ready to move on to the? Oh, sorry. Next topic, will be, next topic will be permits. So I know there was a question, uh, someone came up about <coughs> permits, and I know there's multiple parts to permits. So we'll try to encompass permits. Um, you could bring 50% rule if you want into the conversation. And I know there's some issues in crossovers with historic districts. So let's try to deal with building permit type of issues. And Sean, I'm probably gonna need your help. Okay, yeah, so the next issue is permitting? Yes. Okay, what do you need a permit for, somebody asked. Um, there's a multitude of things, so there's a demolition <laughs> permit. There's... Yeah, if you'd like to approach the microphone, if you have a question, that way we'll all hear you okay. and we'll yes, do it quickly. Yes, I do have a specific permit question or whatever. Um, so I know that on Wednesday you have a permitting tent set up that uh, owners can come up and, and do owner builder permits. But for general contractors, they have to put their permit in uh, through the eConnect. And when I call down to the county to check on permits that have been, I'm, I'm doing subcontracting um, on demolitions of homes. and we have permits that have been sitting there since the middle of December that aren't being processed because I, when I call down there and I talk to the girls, they say it's, you know, they're 35 pages, which is like 800 permits behind. I know you guys are going to be shutting down the, um, the office on Wednesdays and not taking any phone calls or anybody walk in to be able to work on those permits. Um, are you prioritizing the permits for, for demolitions? Are you prioritizing them for areas that were hit hardest? You know, because some of these people just want to be able to move on, and we, we can't do anything until we get that permit done. So how, what's the priority? That's my question. As you said, we are making some operational changes. Uh, we, we've... Uh, we are experiencing a tremendous, tremendous backlog. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's in the thousands. It, it's not just 800. It's, in, it's measured in the thousands of permits uh, to be processed waiting. Uh, like you said, we're actually closing down the next two Wednesdays, uh, tomorrow, uh, all day long, and we're only working on that backlog. We're not taking anything new. We're only working on backlog uh, of everything, whether it be... Uh, and damage repair, new permits, uh, new structures. Uh, we're trying to get through all the backlog. Uh, in addition to those, those closings, we, we've actually changed our, our lobby hours as well. Um, uh, up until about several weeks ago, we were open at uh, seven in the morning till five in the evening. Uh, th there's a lot of energy spent on, in that lobby 
and on the phones and on the emails. So, we, so we've changed the hours from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. That gives staff uh, a, a good, uh, you know, three, four hours a day to really concentrate on that backlog and really attack it. Um, the, those are the, the big operational changes, but it, it, it is quite the backlog to, to, to undertake. Just to be clear, the, what we're closing tomorrow is our office downtown. The Pine Island uh, operation will be at the library tomorrow and operational from, from 10 to 5. Um, on top of all of the stuff we're doing, we're, we're paying a ton of overtime to staff. and We've hired some outside people to try to help us in processing all of this. We could talk about that after the meeting, but just to kind of put this in some type of content, um, since I'm in charge of Lee County in a whole, there's 550,000 parcels. 129,630 were substantially damaged. Whether that's a condo, whether that's a gas station, whether that's a residential house, whether that's a mobile home. So if you could imagine just permits, whether you want demolition or repair, 129,630. There's not enough people to process them quick enough, and we're trying to do it and streamline and work with all the municipalities. But a once in a 500 year event, um, we're trying to process as quickly as we can. And quite frankly, no one really anticipated the damage. Um, but since we're doing stats uh, from the tax assessor's office, there are 129,630 properties that were substantially damaged that we would anticipate that need some form of permit. First of all, thank you for uh, opening up here on Wednesdays. That's tremendous help for us on the island. My wife went down there last Wednesday and received a residential permit. I just need clarification on the zoning review uh, definitions. You have the uh, flood zone is AE, required FEMA elevation is eight feet. Then it says FEMA required, yes. FEMA compliance required, yes. Freeboard elevation, nine feet. And my house is 7.6 feet. How does that play into repairing my house? I mean, what, what takes precedence there? I can get with you after me at, specifically about, about your property, but in general, uh, it sounds like you're, you're dabbling in the 50% the rule. Oh, no, I'm not worried about the 50% rule. I'm just worried about my elevation. Where do I need to be? Does FEMA have the final say on my elevation? Or what... The, the, the building code and flood regulations require, if your house is substantially damaged, which means the cost to repair your structure exceeds 50% of the value of the structure itself, excluding the land. Okay, yes, I understand. Then, then the house would need to be elevated. So if, so if you're in that situation or if someone's in that situation or you're building new, the building code and flood regulations will require the finished floor of the structure in an A zone to be one foot above the base flood elevation. Okay. How that translates to what you said, you were in an AE8. Yes, if, if you were going to bring that into flood compliance, the finished floor would have to be at AE9. If I'm above the 50% rule? If you're substantially damaged, which yes, which means you're, you're, the cost of repair exceeds 50% of the value of the structure. The definition of substantially damaged because I wanted to ask you who determines whether the home is substantially damaged so that you can qualify for um, increased cost of compliance funds from your flood insurer and also if it's impossible to raise the home to current codes what are the alternatives is, is it just a tear down if it exceeds the 50% rule for the, for the ICC, we, my office, my staff works directly with the property owners to get you that letter and the proper documentation to bring to your, your insurance. The, the ICC, we, ICC yeah. letter, uh, a substantial damage determination letter, we, we, it's a, oh, okay. we use almost a template that the insurance companies are looking for. 
Okay. So, so I, I can get with you after the meeting, and if, if that's what you, if you need that, we, yeah, we can go through that process yeah. with you. Uh, the general phone number, which is extremely, extremely busy, so I, I don't want to, uh, you know, make you think it, uh, that it's going to be answered right away. There's, we've experienced some pretty long hold times, but it is 533-8585. So what happens if it's impossible to raise a home as it stands? Because it's, you know... A low ranch house and it can't be raised. I don't, I don't like to use the words impossible. <laughs> um, it might be difficult. Most likely it translates into expensive. It's too yes. expensive to. Yeah. Uh, or not worth it or something. Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. The most common alternative is tear down and rebuild new, which in some, ca some cases ends up being cheaper than elevating it. since we can get it right from the, from the mouth. Okay, the 50% the, the rule is, refers to a structure that's in a special flood hazard area, a flood zone. Uh, usually most on Pine Island are A zones, AE zones. Uh, there's coastal A zones and there's V zone, the velocity zones Bob was talking about. If your property is in one of those zones, any work you do, any improvement or repair, that's what they call substantial damage or substantial improvement. If the value of that repair or the improvement exceeds 50% of the value of the structure and the structure alone, excluding the land, then that building is considered substantially damaged or substantially improved, which the, re the regulations were required to you to elevate that structure to, in an A zone, finished floor would be one foot above the base flood elevation on the flood map. In a B zone or a coastal A, it's actually a little more technical, the one foot above the lowest horizontal structural member. Who is the determining factor of the value of the reno renovation and the value of that improvement? The contractor? Or the, who, whoever is doing the work. Or the homeowner. Property owner, homeowner, contractor, anybody who's performing, performing the work. So the homeowner can perform the work themselves. The homeowner can perform the, the, the work themselves on a property that they own. There are handouts in the back that explain the 50% rule that, that are back there in the lobby. You determine the value of that improvement. You determine that value if you choose. And, and to expand that on that, the contractor owner determines the value of the repair. In, in a lot of cases, through the process, uh, you, you'll have to demonstrate that, how you achieve that number. Uh, it, it's, it's, you can, a detailed cost breakdown. Is what, is what we would call it. We ask you line by line, how many two by fours? What is that two per, how much does it cost? What's the labor to install it? How many sheets of drywall? How many screws? How much tape? How much mud? Line by line, uh, and, and, we, and you do de detail breakdown. Us, GPIA, we will work with you and I will help you through that personally if you need. And I will work with you on finding those costs and make sure that if you do not exceed that 50%, we will make sure you do not exceed that 50%. The county's not speaking to have a national estimator that knows those actual costs for electric plumbing and all that material. You can't fudge those numbers. The county's not speaking. We're not, we're not fudging them. You just go on HomeDepot.com and you quote you the cost of a two by four. So on our website, you actually have a breakdown where taxable value, both building and or land. If you think the building valuation is lower than it is, you have the right to go get an appraisal, to have a certified appraisal indicate that value is higher, and then your 50% is the higher number as long as it was done with a appraisal, state certified appraisal. Yes. Well, my problem is that we have not had a FEMA inspector look at our place. 
and we've been down here since the 1st of December, and we've had a whole bunch of problems. Number one, we had to file for the reason why we couldn't be down here. I had my shoulder joint replaced, so I couldn't get down here until then. So we filed. She had to write a letter, my wife wrote a letter, why we weren't down here for the first inspection, which we never uh, established. So then, a couple weeks later, they find out, oh, they can't read the, what she wrote. She did it again. That's Time was going by. She did it again. And a couple of weeks go by and say, oh, you got your wrong phone number. They had my phone number correctly, my wife's not. 239, we've never had a 239 phone number. Never. And so this process, well, we've been here since 1st of December. We haven't got anything. I mean, we had some volunteers, so the Legion came in and cleaned out our house because I couldn't lift it. But other than that, some people come in and try to tarp the roof. But we're dead. We can't do anything. So um, have you visited the Disaster Recovery Center here on yes. Amherst? Okay. My wife goes there every week. Okay. So in the back, yeah. there's a couple of representatives there that can uh, work to get your inspection expedited to make sure that you get that inspection. That's what they should have done. Okay. When they screwed it up. Okay. So, okay, we'll try it. Okay. That's almost three months now and nothing. Thank you. Come on. Hi, I have four questions, kind of putting them all together. But the one I wanted to find out, a couple, was the septic. How does that work when your house was demolished and you want to put a new place on it? What's the permitting? What's the regulation for the septic? The Department of Health actually permits, inspects, and regulates septic systems. Um, in the example, if, if, you're, if you're demoing, I, I believe the state is expediting uh, the review or, or approval. They're, they're providing a letter to the applicants fairly quickly from what I understand. Uh, for Department, Department of Health for a demo for if you're going to build a new structure and therefore a new septic system th that's a whole perm the whole permitting uh, process through the state as a new system. But do we have to get the new system? If we have a perfectly working order system do the, we? The, the new structure the, you'll, the state will still look at your existing system to make sure it will handle whatever load the okay. uh, the new structure or replacement structure can handle. Yeah, no. what, it was not no. damaged? No, because we have a state trailer, so it's all hooked up. But we want to put a new structure on there. And we're hearing that everybody has to move them to the front if you're on a canal. It has to be so many feet from the back, blah, 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 blah. So we're the trying to figure system? out. Hmm? The septic system? Mm -hmm. I could take your name and, and get with my contacts at, at the health department. Okay. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be able to answer any direct questions, especially to that granular okay. level. So it sounds like your septic was not damaged, but I, I called in one of our experts just so other people. If your structure was damaged and your septic was damaged or a tree went through it or uprooted and pulled it up, in your case, that's not the case. You may be eligible for FEMA to replace your septic at full cost. You have to appeal. Uh, it has to be evaluated. It has to be costed out and whatnot. But you may be eligible if your septic plan was completely destroyed. It's a, it's it's not in our normal programs, but it, because it's an environmental issue, uh, that is something that may be eligible for FEMA. Not in your case, but I just want to mention that. Should anybody else in the audience know somebody here that has, we have on some of the areas of Lee County people that had their septics uh, damaged. Thank you. And then the next one is the flood elevation. We know that it's AE9, but we're already hearing that you guys are gonna bump it up two more feet. Is that like really true? Because if you I haven't heard that one. The, All right, the, cool. The FEMA just, we just adopted brand new maps and that, that was almost a five year process in itself. Um, 
it, it's very complicated, it's very long, it's very drawn out, a lot of red tape. Um, I, I, yeah, there's, okay. no, there's no plans that I know of from FEMA, the state or local of, of making any type of change. Okay, and then what about the contents they me mentioned before, like the 37.9? We were told when, when I went to the FEMA trailer way back when, we were told we had to go through SBA first, and then what SBA didn't loan us, which it's hard to get a loan through them. I mean, we're willing to pay it back. And I won't go into that any further, but how do we get that 39.7? Not even all of it, but all of our, you know, everything's gone. Yeah, so again, it's up to 37,900 for structure, up to 37,900 for contents. You apply for the SBA, um, and Congress has made it clear, if you don't qualify for SBA, they refer you back to uh, FEMA, and that's when that, that decision is made. The inspector comes out and they make an estimate, regardless of home or flood insurance or anything, they just make an, an estimate on what they see as damages separately and independently, and then you would be eligible for those amounts. Okay. Is anybody doing anything about the cost of insurance around here now? I mean, I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> so, up at the legislature, when I was at special session, when I opened up this meeting, um, there was a lot of reform to obviously bring down the cost. The biggest um, impediment has been legal, um, and obviously the just we are 80% of the claims that are filed are filed in Florida. So, they put a lot of tort reform in this past um, which obviously will then give more of a free market to take place. Obviously, if you don't hold people accountable and they can sue you and you run up excessive fees, so the governor was very specific about that uh, being part of the special session that was passed on. So we do anticipate a better marketplace out there. But it was okay. one of the biggest issues. And then I kind of fibbed. I have a fifth question now because of FEMA. But if we filed everything before, that January 12th doesn't affect us, right? That's correct. Anybody that's in our system already registered, uh, they are still eligible for FEMA full FEMA benefits. The other thing, because people do ask, is related. That does not mean that a disaster recovery center here closes. We have even, not even had a conversation with the county about any closures of disaster recovery centers anywhere in Lee County. We have seven, and we're about to open an eighth. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, I, I'd like to say that it's now after 8 o'clock and a number of people have left. Um, I have the feeling that people are getting tired and we are not going to get through the whole long list of issues. Is that right? Um, Kevin, if you can uh, look at the list and so, see how many more so issues what, there are. What I committed to was two hours. And at 8.30, we'll break um, because obviously, and we'll come back as often as you need us to. And um, uh, also, I'm going to be paying for the cost of tonight. So I'll pay it out of my pocket so you don't have to worry about it. So, um, Oh, thank you. No problem. <laughs> um, I don't have that a helps a Gladly, lot. Let's answer your questions. All right. Well, first of all, my wife and I, we're new to the island. Uh, we moved here. We, we did owner builder. And I have to say that the permitting office did an awesome job. You guys just, you know knocked out of the park. We, this is the first time we built a house on our own. Uh, we're in the Eagle Zone. We did the pandemic. I built at the peak of lumber prices. <laughs> it was a hurdle. You guys made it a lot less painful. So I'll, I'd like to take my hand out to you for that. Um, but I do have a problem with one of my neighbors, which I think maybe these gentlemen can help me with. She has uh, fallen under the 50% rule. Unfortunately, she hired a public adjuster. Well, we know what the public adjusters do. They try to get that number as high as possible. So she's past the 50% of being able to rebuild her house, okay? Um, is there anything we do? Because I know as well, we have some damage on our houses and, you know, we got these storm chasers out there, shingles, for instance, you know, shingle roofs, they're getting eight, nine hundred dollars a square to remove and replace. You find a local guy down here and he's doing it for 500, you know? Um, these public adjusters want those numbers to be as high as possible because of course they're going to get their 10 percent on top of that. So how do we get that value back down so this lady can rebuild her house? Well, well it sounds like the permit process hasn't begun. It, it has. Correct. So, so we, we wouldn't, we would only take the numbers that, that you bring to us. So if, if your neighbor brought us with the permit application with the values like, like, like we just explained with, with values of all the material and, and ended up with a cost, we wouldn't be looking at insurance adjusters estimate or anything. It'd be 
the cost that you've demonstrated I mean, I've during the permit process, what the cost is, and that, that's what we'll accept okay. and take. Sure, cause, because on my roof alone, I've gotten prices anywhere from $29,000 down to you know $21,000. That's a, when you start adding up each component of rebuilding a house, that adds up fast and it puts you over the top. Mm -hmm. So, okay. We, we will take whatever you present to us okay. or the applicant gives to us. As, okay, and as then as data. far, is there a, there's a point of contact I can put her in charge with for FEMA because she's been denied a trailer. Um, she ran out of her uh, different additional living expense money. She doesn't have anywhere to go. She's living in a very small trailer right next to her house. And the trailer, the toilet doesn't work in it anymore. She's using our shower, which I have no problem with. Come on over my shower, use my bath. But she's in, she's in desperate need. All her charge cards are run to the limit. She doesn't have anywhere to go. So she yeah, needs help. Yeah, so after the meeting, give me a name and the FEMA case number or a follow-up number, and we'll, we'll get somebody to look into the case and, and figure out what we can do. Thanks. Oh, okay. One more on the permit uh, in Pine Island Library. My wife got a permit last week issued for residential remodel. And then we got a letter this week that suspended it because there was a $10 fee that was assessed with no knowledge of it at that uh, issuing. If, if you want to get out after the meeting, I'll, I'll take your address and look into what it is, okay. what the fee was. Something that small is probably admin rate on. And, and someone else that was fee. with her also got the same letter saying the same suspension of that right. permit. So I don't okay, that yeah, is. well then, then it might help me okay. overall to look into your problem. Thank you. Any other permit, 50% um, type questions? Okay, I'll close that topic and I'm gonna close and not get into the next topic because it's 8.15, um, but I've committed to come back um, as we continue to go through these issues. The other thing I would ask you to do is, I come weekly to the Greater Pine Island uh, Alliance. So come, um, let us know your problems because I don't wanna wait weeks to try to resolve something. Staff has been with me through this whole process. So like I said before, there's a number of things we've been able to implement very quickly that you're asking for as residents. Just to understand the size of this storm is so significant, no matter what resources we throw at it, it's never enough. And when I go through my entire district, it's heartbreaking to see the devastation through my entire district. So all I could say is that I've never seen anything like this. I came two weeks before Hurricane Charlie, and Hurricane Charlie, when I was on Sanibel, was a walk in the park compared to this one. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand your need. Continue to communicate with us. My office is 533-2224. Feel free to call my office. My assistant's been with me for the 16 years I've been in office, so feel free to call my office. We'll try to address any issues you have, and I'll continue to come here um, every week to meet with the Alliance, um, unless I have to go to Tallahassee to try to bring us home money. Yes, sir. By the way, the Pine Island, Greater Pine Island Alliance meets every Tuesday, except the Tuesdays that we're meeting here, uh, at 5.30 at the Beacon of Hope. And anyone can come? Uh, yeah. Commissioner, I, I just have one uh, comment for next meeting, not this meeting. And I think many of us, our biggest problem is with citizens insurance. And if there's a representative from citizens or something that we can do because we're getting no response and it, it, we are, uh, our credit cards are, are maxed out. We are trying to get our general contractor to, to help us rebuild, but our problem is getting any response from citizens and anything close, they're lowballing us all on the, the uh, uh, checks that we're getting. We need help with citizens more than probably anything else. Mm. Thank you. No problem, I will see what we can do to try to assist in those areas. Um, the first 13 years of my corporate life, I was in the insurance industry, so, very familiar with um, the process, I just tell people, just say no. And honestly, I can recall, and I'll tell a story um, from Hurricane Charlie. So I came here two weeks um, before Hurricane Charlie. Um, I had an assessment on my pool cage. Um, they came out and said it was $40,000. Citizens told me to insure it for $40,000, I did. First check I got was 8,000. Next check I got was 2,000. Next check I got was 6,000. Next check I got was 4,000. But every time I fought with them, by the ninth check, 
I received all the money, so don't give up. But I'll try to see whatever representation we can do. But it's your money. You paid for it. Continue to fight. And just don't take a final settlement. But I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with you. I'll be here after the meeting. And I can't thank my staff enough for coming here uh, to address your issues. And honestly, as long as we have questions we'll bring out here, please come to the Alliance. Because I can honestly tell you, these guys have done amazing work in a short period of time. And it really is proactive to try to react to your situations. And thank you, Helen, for having me. Um, and I'm going to be here until we rebuild. Thank you. Okay, I have one announcement uh, before uh, calling for a motion to adjourn, and that is I've just learned that the Methodist Church here is available on Tuesday, January 24th for, uh, for a meeting to continue to address your questions. If we have a significant number of issues that haven't been addressed, um, we'll, that we want to just tentatively say that that is a possible date. Um, and we'll let you all know. Come to the Alliance, too. Okay. Come to the Alliance, too. Because a lot of people have personal questions, individual questions, that don't necessarily apply to everybody. Um, and those are the ones you want to ask uh, Commissioner Ruain and all these other wonderful people who have come here individually. So they'll be sticking around, I think, a little bit after uh, tonight. Okay, is there a motion to adjourn tonight? Okay, thank you, Mike. Is there a second? All in favor, raise your hand if you're ready to adjourn. Thank you, and good night.